Good evening, everybody. I'm Bill Bowie. Welcome to our committee and board meetings this evening, January 25th, 2023. It is 615 and I will make the requisite motion so that we can conduct these meetings virtually. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA and the Fairfax County Emergency Ordinance, the Park Authority Board needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record as we did at our first electronic meeting. During our meeting, if you wish to be recognized, please raise your hand and when I recognize you, please say your name. This will ensure that you are recognized and the public knows who is speaking. If you intend to vote nay or abstain on any item, you, we will need to do roll calls on those votes. Because each member of the board is participating in, meet, in these meetings from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all of the other members. Accordingly, I'm, I'm going to conduct a roll call and ask each board member participating in these meetings to state your name and the location from which you are participating. <clears throat> I will ask that each of you pay close attention so that you can ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues. And following the roll call, we will vote to establish that every, every member can hear every other member's voice. And we'll start alphabetically. Also, if anybody's not here at the beginning of the roll call, we will ask them um, as they join the meeting to verify their audibility and their location. So, Dr. Hewton. I'm not Hewton, joining from my residence in Franconia District. Dr. Carter. Hello, I'm Cynthia Jacobs Carter, and I'm joining from my home in Franconia District. Maggie Godbold. Hi, I'm Maggie Godbold, and I'm joining from my home in the Sully District. Linwood Gorham. This is Linwood Gorham, and I'm participating from my home in the Mount Vernon District. Tim Hackman. Tim Hackman, participating from my residence in the Drainsville District. Ron Kendall. This is Ron Kendall. I'm participating from my residence in the Dominican Republic. Faisal Khan. Faisal Khan, I'm at my residence in Providence District. Ken Quincy. Ken Quincy, participating from my residence in Providence District. Kyle Stone. Kyle Stone, Bradford District Representative, participating from George Mason University. Mike Thompson. Mike Thompson, participating from my office in Alexandria. Jim Zook. Jim Zook, participating from my home in the Springfield District. All right, and I'm Bill Bowie, and I'm participating from my home in the Hunter Mill District. At this point, I'll pass the virtual gavel to Vice Chairman Godbowl so that I may be heard to make the requisite motion. I move that each member's voice may be adequately heard by each other member of this board. This is Maggie Godbowl. You all have heard the motion. Is there a second? This is Mike Thompson. I second the motion. It has been, this is Maggie Godbold. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Mr. Chairman, that motion passes. Thank you, Maggie. This is Bill Bowie. Second, having established that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that compels these emergency procedures the fact that we are meeting electronically, what type of electronic of communication is being used, and how we have arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this board to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. And that as such, FOIA's usual procedures which require the physical assembly of this board and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that this board may conduct this meeting electronically via Zoom, it is so moved. This is Maggie Godbold, you all have heard the motion. Is there a second? Tim Hackman, I second. Thank you, Tim, this is Maggie again. Is there any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Mr. Chairman, the motion is approved. Thank you, Maggie. This is Bill Bowie. 
And now that all the preliminary matters are out of the way, we will begin with the administrative and board management committee meeting. And I will turn it over to Chairman Khan. Remember when you're speaking, please state your name. Faisal? This is Faisal Khan. I call the administration and board management committee meeting to order. Allison, would you please introduce the items? Good evening. My name is Allison Rankin um, with the Park Authority. Uh, as you all know, we have long been through a long process to review and update the policy manual. So we're bringing it to you hopefully one final time tonight. The process, as we've gone through each time, the staff has reviewed it. They recommended changes. It was reviewed by our senior management team. We brought those draft policies to this committee over the course of the last year. We compiled all those changes and those suggested by the board and sent them up back to the county attorney for their review. Um, and now we're bringing the final draft of the policy manual to you for approval. This is our final step. The county attorney had no suggested changes based on the edits that we had proposed. Um, so we would like to, the, with the approval of the committee, we would bring the final draft manual to the board for final approval in, at their meeting in February. And that's it. All right. So are there any questions, discussion? No. Seeing and hearing none, do we have a consensus to move this forward? Oh, yes. 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 All right. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Well, with that, I guess I this is going to be the fastest one, I guess. So <laughs> I hereby adjourn the administration and board management meeting. Thank you, Faisal. You're welcome, sir. All right. So we're on hiatus for three minutes. Okay, it's 625, time for the Park Operations Committee meeting, and I will turn it over to Chairman Linwood Gorham. This is Lynn Woodworm. I'd like to call the uh, Park Operations Committee to order. And our first order of business uh, is uh, an operations project update by uh, Dan Sutherland. Please take it away, Dan. All right. Thank you, Lynn Wood. Uh, and good night or good evening, everyone. This is Dan Sutherland with the Park Operations Division. Uh, and what we have for you tonight is a uh, presentation on. Uh, second quarter projects uh, from October through December of 2022. Next slide, please. Uh, just a reminder, uh, as we prioritize our projects, um, we typically consider many different aspects uh, when it comes to the condition of the different facilities. We then try to rank uh, the each of those projects based upon an assessment that we've done that covers everything from seven uh, safety to the revenue impact, late amount of use, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, as we evaluate, go through the list, we then make the proper selection considering all the different factors. Uh, next slide, please. So first up, we have uh, in the uh, Springfield District, uh, Burke Lake Bathhouse B. You will see some before and after pictures that were completed by our facilities uh, staff. Uh, a complete refurbishment of the facilities and they look uh, a lot nicer. The funds uh, that contributed towards the project were Fund 300 and it was just under 100,000. Next slide, please. In the Providence District, uh, some repairs were made to the basketball courts at Borg Street Park. Uh, our uh, centralized grounds maintenance branch did the work. Uh, the project was just under $80,000 $80, and sinking fund monies were used to complete the renovation. Next slide, please. At uh, Fairfax Villa Park in Braddock District, uh, a bridge was replaced uh, with the uh, partnership between the uh, mobile crew and uh, the area crew responsible for the bridge. Um, and as you can see there in the pictures, the uh, community uh, is kind of showing some love to the old bridge as it was uh, about to uh, uh, be removed and saying their goodbyes. Uh, but the uh, new bridge went in. It's a fiberglass bridge. Uh, proper funds were used to replace the bridge. It was just under $50,000. Um, 
and again, it was completed by the staff and the Parker uh, mobile crew and the uh, area scrap, crew staff. Next slide, please. In the Franconia district at the Olander and Margaret Banks Park, uh, we added some benches, uh, a little bit of a minor improvement, but definitely uh, improvement that was uh, sought after by the friends of the park and many users of the park as there were not previously any benches, just a couple of picnic tables. So staff installed some benches throughout the park uh, to help to meet the needs of the many visitors to the park. Uh, uh, this project was just over $3,000 and was completed by the Area 3 staff using Fund 300 monies. Next slide, please. Uh, over in uh, the Mason District, District at Providence Rec Center, uh, there were some concerns raised about some older wooden steps, timber steps there on the trail uh, that had become decayed and were a little bit undersized uh, for safety reasons, we uh, staff went ahead and replaced the steps, putting in a wider step and putting in actually some uh, some grit, uh, traction grit uh, on the steps so that anybody walking up and down the steps uh, was less likely to slip. Uh, very, very modest cost at just over $100 in materials and uh, a couple of days worth of staff time. The work was performed by the Area 2 staff. And again, they used existing operating funds and Fund 300. Uh, next slide, please. Over in the Hunter Mills District, uh, in the difficult run stream valley, uh, some trail improvements were, were made uh, over there at the trail that runs right near the Dulles Access Road, um, or right under the Dulles Access Road, I should say. Uh, the trail project cost just under $50,000 and was completed by uh, uh, the Centralized Management, uh, Grounds Management Group, as well as area six staff in support. And fund 300 funds were used to complete the project. Next slide, please. Uh, another trail project, this one at Ash Grove Historic Site in the Hunter Mill District. As you can see, there were a lot of root pops and other trip hazards along the trail. So the surface of the trail was uh, was renovated. It was done through contract and overseen by our centralized grounds services branch and using Fund 300 monies. Next slide, please. Uh, another trail project, this one in the Mason District at Broy Hill Crest uh, Park. In the background, you can see a bridge that went in uh, several years ago, a fiberglass bridge. And so this really did finish off the uh, bridge by uh, resurfacing the trail that connected the existing asphalt trail to the uh, the newer bridge. Uh, the project was just under $15,000 completed by centralized ground services branch and was completed with a contractor using Fund 300 monies. Next slide, please. Uh, once again, uh, many, many feet of trail done uh, over at Fry and Pan Park in the Hunter Mill District. Uh, you can see we're uh, really decayed um, and uh, broken up asphalt, existing asphalt surface that was allowing a lot of undergrowth to grow through it, and which was a trip hazard and could often be a slip hazard in uh, wetter conditions. Uh, project was just under $30,000 and completed again by the centralized sur ground services branch uh, through a contractor using Fund 300 dollars. Next slide, please. Uh, at Kendale Woods Park, a trail, a little minor, smaller trail was done, uh, but much needed work. As you can see, there some root pops that were uh, causing trip hazards, um, and there were some other undulations in the trail. So the work helped to smooth it out and make it a little bit safer for uh, patrons as they go through the park. Uh, the work was just over $30,000, uh, and it was done by our centralized ground services branch with a contractor using Fund 300 monies. Next slide, please. And that was the last project. Any questions on any of those projects? All right, I thank you all very much and you all have a good night and I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Gore to, to introduce some another presentation. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn the, uh, the meeting over to uh, Kevin Williams now to talk about the uh, forestry budget update. Take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Gorham. Good evening. This is Kevin Williams, Park Operations Branch Manager. And I'm going to give you an update on our forestry budget. Uh, we spoke to this group a couple of years ago. I'll give you an update at that time. We've had some 
some changes in our in our status as to how things have been going. So I wanted to give you uh, a rundown on that today. So next slide, please. Just to give you a baseline of what our budget situation is, our salaries and benefits totaling $830,000. As for eight full-time staff and two part-time staff with a contract budget of $326,000. With these funds, we're currently only addressing uh, reactive work to extreme and high risk tree removals. Uh, we also have medium and low risk uh, trees that we assess that we're not able to get to. And we're certainly not able to do any proactive work, whether it be you know, pruning or proactive inspections. We receive calls and we, we uh, act like a fire department, go out and address it. So that's our current um, operation. Next slide, please. Just to give you a rundown of our work distribution over the last few years. So our contractors are, are tackling a lot of our extreme high risk and emergency trees, uh, jobs that have a greater risk for private property damage and or injury to staff and uh, patrons. And then our staff are handling more of the routine jobs, still high risk trees, not the urgent emergency ones, and just a slightly lower risk for damaged property and staff injury. And in the table you can see over the last few years, the staffing, these are quantity of trees that we've worked on. And the staffing has stayed about the same, right around a thousand trees per year. And our contract numbers are going up in the quantity of trees. So from 700 and change to over 1200 last year on contract, which is affecting our ratio of how much we do with staff and contract. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a reminder of uh, how we assess our trees, the risk rating that is associated with it. This is a standard risk assessment from the International Society of Arboriculture that we use uh, when we're going out and inspecting trees and we assign a risk rating. And then the purple highlighted dashed boxes, those are the extreme and high risk categories. When a tree falls into these categories, this is what we mean by high and extreme risk or priority one trees. This is all that we're focusing on currently. So all the other trees that are still moderate and low risk, uh, those are ones that are not worked on currently. Next slide, please. So some concerns and some of the response that we've been seeing here lately, um, oak trees have become a bigger issue for us. The phenomenon of oak decline has been impacting Fairfax for several years now. You can uh, see from FY13, we've increased 240% in the amount of oaks that we're removing since uh, 10 years ago. Uh, along with that, there's a larger diameter in trees that we're dealing with. Uh, so the bigger the trees are going up, there's more frequency, uh, quantity of trees that are dying. Our contract costs are also rising. And the, the funding that we're uh, using to deal with this is being reallocated from other park projects and maintenance budgets to address these growing safety needs. What you won't see on this uh, concerns is the emerald ash borer that was such an issue several years ago has uh, leveled out. It's actually declining quite a bit as far as the impact. We're dealing with less uh, trees as far as ash trees are concerned. We're still dealing with it. Uh, we have some funding associated with it that I'll talk about in a minute, but the bigger issue now is oak trees and oak decline uh, versus what it was several years ago with the ash and emerald ash borer. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of what oak decline is and how it's impacting the county. Uh, this is a statement from Urban Forestry uh, Director Brian Keatley. Uh, so the main factors associated with oak decline is just the maturity of the tree, an extended drought period, and typically a late spring frost. Uh, and according to him, we should continue to see oak decline throughout the county as we have a mature stock of those species, various species of oaks uh, throughout the county. And we're seeing that now. Uh, this was a statement from several years ago, and now we're realizing the impacts. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a summary of, again, some of the work and the contract dollars associated with it. So again, from 2013, we removed just under a thousand trees 10 years ago, whereas last year we removed over 2,200 trees. Uh, as that number has gone up, so has our dollars spent on contracts uh, significantly from $237,000 a year up to $961,000 last year spent on contract. 
uh, the note there in the middle in 2020 is when we received the $250,000 from the pest funding to address the emerald ash borer removal of ash trees. So that was the significant drop from 2019 mm -hmm. to 2020, where we were no longer having to afford uh, ash removals out of our budget. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a summary of the budget requests that we've had over the years. So dating back to 2017, uh, you'll see if it just focus at the bottom there, we, we had an amount received of $212,000 change. That was the last large increase to our budget at that time. We were operating on a $63,000 contract budget specifically. Let me clarify that this is a contract budget slide. Uh, so since then, you can see we've been asking for money in, in 2018, a third quarter request of 300,000, a recurring request in 19 of 160 in 2020, and it goes on a third quarter request in 21. The main point here being is we've continued to request funds from the county, and aside from the large increase in 2017, we've received very little. Uh, we did get some money last year, and, or this year, uh, 2023 is a $50,000 bump. But that's tied directly to the new properties that we've been acquiring. So this is the maintenance, tree maintenance in response uh, to the new properties that have been acquired over the last few years. So in 23, we're also in the process of putting forward a third quarter request for $500,000, uh, as well as an FY24 request recurring in one time, totaling $739,000. And that includes some staffing equipment and contract dollars. And the far right red column that's probably standing out to you, these are the dollars that we are spending over our budget. So our uh, contract budget of $276,000. This is what we're spending above and beyond that. And then this fiscal year 23, you can see the asterisks that we're projected to be $1.2 million over our budget if we continue to go down uh, the current pace that we're on. Next slide, please. This is another uh, way of looking at some of the same information. So I wanted to highlight the last few years as the, the drastic um, increase and in, in challenge of funding. Uh, the summary here being is where, where are we spending our money from to deal with all these you know, risky trees and the safety need. Our forestry budget, as I mentioned, is 276,000 and it bumped up to 326 this year. We've been taking funding from Park maintenance, general park maintenance in other areas, whether it be playgrounds, athletic courts, picnic shelters, you name it, uh, other areas of park maintenance that aren't getting attention that we're deferring maintenance there to address the tree issue here. Uh, we've spent uh, over a million dollars in that category over the last few years of park maintenance that's not getting done. The general fund has also contributed just about $900,000 the last few years where we're taking funds from general fund to offset the, uh, the forestry need. And we've also spent $110,000 out of athletic fields uh, to address trees in and around the athletic facilities. Uh, the $3.17 million is the total what we've spent on trees in the last four years. Of that $3.17, million of it is over the budget that we have to operate with. So just in the last four years, it's been $2 million over our budget. Uh, the highlight, again, with the, the first asterisk is uh, we're taking a million dollars from uh, park maintenance and addressing trees. So that million dollars could have gone towards a trail, a court, a park bench, what have you. And it's not currently. Uh, the 1.05 million in the top right corner of, this, of the table, that is the current funding that's been set aside this year. That is not what we project needing this year. That's just what we've identified to date to be able to spend. Next slide, please. Another way of looking at it on a line graph, uh, the green and blue lines are the FY20 and 21 numbers of contract expenses throughout the year, week zero to week 52. Uh, the black line was last uh, fiscal year FY22. You can see the jump there as we start to deal with these oak issues. And then of course the red is this year and where we're at currently and where we're projecting to go if we stay on the current path. So over the last three years, you know, at this point in the year, we were at about $334,000 spent. Well, that's $418,000 less than where we are this year. We're currently at the $750,000 mark of expenses. And again, we're projecting that $1.5 million 
is where we will end up if we continue to spend on this pace. Next slide, please. Some of the overall impacts and, and what are the results of those? So the funding, obviously we don't have enough funding currently to deal with it. Um, our current funding that's been set aside is, is going to be exhausted uh, mid to late April at this current pace. I mentioned the $3.7 million. That's, of, that's deferred maintenance in the last decade. So FY13 to 23, we have deferred $3.7 million from park maintenance to address trees. There are several unfunded projects that we're currently trying to address. Uh, 570 some thousand dollars worth and these are a couple of um, examples of what those are you know court lights at gw we can't deal with tree stumps we cut the tree and the stump sits there and, and it's uh, can't be dealt with we have a volleyball court in ottawa that we need to rebuild you know, we have park counters we're trying to purchase and install to gather more data on our park use uh, backflow preventers and athletic field improvements that can't be done just some examples of some of the things that we're not currently able to fund because of the situation. Uh, some of the other results that we're, we're dealing with, again, is the compounding deferred maintenance in the last 10 years. That's a lot of money, $3 million, almost $4 million that we've deferred. So we're delaying job completion on a lot of those tasks. Uh, it's a growing backlog of issues. And we have a lot of increase of risk to patrons when it comes to tree risk. You know, the neighbors, the tree crews, you know, the trees are deteriorating and we can't deal with it all. And we're just increasing our liability. We're increasing you know, tree-related damages and claims associated with it from private property. Of course, with that comes the complaints and public concern about how we're dealing with this. So next slide, please. These are just some of our glamour shots of what we encounter and what we deal with. Um, you know, the things that we can't get to and the tree happens to fail. Unfortunately, it does hit things. And this is just a few examples of what we encounter in the parks. Next slide, please. So trying to figure out where we go from here, if, we, if we're not gonna receive additional funds, uh, you know, we need to limit the trees that are removed by contractor. Obviously that's the cost. Uh, we may be looking at enacting a prioritization of uh, priority 1A and 1B. So splitting that priority into two different categories. And then of course, you know, we're dealing with an increased backlog uh, and the risk associated with it, as well as the complaints. Next slide, please. So part of the 1A and 1B scenario, just to give you some examples of what that might be. So 1A, we would target high value targets and how we deal with trees. So it, the high value target being example, a high, uh, high use area, a major roadway, high value property damage could result. You know, it could be playgrounds, trails, significant cultural historical resources. Those are some of the categories that will fall into the 1A you know, if this tree hits something, is it significant? Then we should put it in a 1A category. Next slide, please. Just some examples of the 1B. It's still a high priority, still a high risk, still some potential for damage, uh, but maybe it's an open yard or an open park area. Maybe it's just a fence or a shed, not an occupied space, perhaps. Uh, so there's um, you know, moderate to high value property damage as well associated with it just not as high as a 1A might be. Next slide, please. So additional funding, we mentioned the $500,000 third quarter request that we're, we're uh, putting forward. That's what we need to stay on our current pace this fiscal year. That'll put us to the $1.5 million number that we're anticipating we'll need. $721,000 is what we've taken from other funding sources currently that we'd like to give the funds back to those areas to achieve the park maintenance that's been deferred. And again, that $1.22 million uh, projected over budget number, if we stay on our current pace and finish out the year, that's where we will end up. And that money has to come from somewhere. So next slide. Our next steps again is to confirm that the third quarter request uh, with the uh, DMB across the street. And if we do not receive that funding, then we will likely start to initiate our 1A and 1B scenario just to finish out this year. Obviously, there's impacts beyond this year that uh, we're hoping for the FY24 uh, budget request uh, to be approved as well. But this is our short term uh, next steps. And that is all. Any questions? I'd be glad to answer.
Go ahead, Tim. Thank you, Lindwood. Tim Hackman. Um, uh, uh, some comments. Uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, it was uh, uh, I was made aware the other day of that. Um, uh, obviously, Fairfax County historically was uh, primarily a uh, uh, an agricultural farming related uh, county, and as those pro farming uh, farming areas were abandoned and allowed to. Uh, uh, return to uh, growth. I mean, clearly as farming, they had been clear cut. Uh, as growth was allowed to uh, resume, uh, we're now in a situation where for any particular tract of, of, of property uh, that we own, uh, many of the mature trees uh, on the property are going to be roughly the same age and are going to um, be starting to uh, uh, die and fail at, uh, at roughly the same time. When you take into account then also uh, climate change and species migration, uh, that's, a, that's a compounding that, uh, that impact to the, uh, uh, the, the old clear cutting uh, um, situation. So I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, A, if we can add those arguments to our, uh, uh, the, the case that we're making with the county and B, whether the county also has um, uh, climate change impact funds uh, to which we might tap into that could help uh, offset our uh, forestry cost needs. Thank you. Yeah, this is Linwood again. Um, questions for leadership. Um, do you have any strategies or leadership have any strategies at this point um, or um, I, I guess that 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 is the whole question. I guess they would be strategies uh, to to get uh, some funding from across the street. And do we anticipate um, getting it, or who knows at this point? So, Jay Cole, Executive Director, um, I, this is one of the you know there are things that we do that you know is important. Um, everything that we do is important, and there are things that 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 you know keep us up at night. Um, this is one of those things that keep us up at night. Um, this is beyond, um, this is safety. This is the safety of our patrons. This is safety of our, um, forget about um, um, stuff. Um, so we, we are talking definitely all the time, talking every time that there's a submission for any, we put in forestry, um, especially with the oak decline and the significant increase that we're seeing now. <laughs> Um, one of the one of the things we're talking about is possibly going to the environmental committee um, at the board of supervisor to to lay out sort of like the Emerald Ash Borer came out um, the situation. The more money that we get on the front end, the less money that the county has to spend on insurance um, for every time that uh, trees come down. Um, it's just trying to explain. Um, it's trying to explain the situation and how dire. It is it's very hard to comprehend, you know, 27,000 yeah. acres and how many property lines that we share with uh, residents and infrastructure. Um, so this is a constant, um, a constant uh, battle. This is, you know, where we are right now. Nobody expected us to be uh, before this high up and Kevin hit the nail on, thank you, Kevin. Kevin hit the nail on the head. Every, it's the number one priority. So everything has to go by the wayside for what Kevin and his staff want to do um, when trees have to come down. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I do think uh, Tim's comments were uh, very logical and insightful uh, and uh, for presentations going forward, uh, an explanation for why um, the, the number keeps going up and why we would have a glut right now in the county's history of these age trees that are all at an age of, uh, um, you know, possibly dying and stuff like that at the end of their life cycle would be a really healthy thing to, to help the supervisors and people across the street understand. Uh, that's provided, Kevin, that you, uh, you agree with uh, Tim's assessment uh, of the farmland to trees. A lot of them are the same age, that kind of stuff. Is that, is that something that you... Uh, believed to be accurate, Kevin? Not exactly familiar with uh, the history here, but uh, based on what we're seeing in the aging forests that we do have, it's not far from reality, I'm sure. Yeah. We, can, we can certainly check with our natural resources folks to get an accurate answer on that. 
Yeah, pe- people just always want to know why. And, you know, again, I'm sitting here asking myself why. And then Tim spoke up and I go, boy, that's really logical. Ron, you have something. Yeah, um, I must have missed something along the way in the history, history of this, because I thought two to three years ago, we had found buy-in at the Board of Supervisors to develop a second forestry team. And they had agreed that with a second team, there'd have to be additional funding. I don't understand why we haven't gone back to the board and identified that they said that they were on board with us developing a second team. Now's the time to put the money up for it. Um, I understand that we're having this problem, but we need to do, if they're still balking at it, we need to do a better job of identifying the train that's coming down the tracks here. Um, We need to identify what our liability is and how much it's going to cost us in 10 years, not just look at the next year. We need to be able to tell them in 10 years, we're going to have liabilities of 10 to $20 million from property owners or people on trails who are getting hurt by, by falling limbs if we don't clear this stuff out. We've made that argument for every year I know of since I've been on this board. And I think they agreed with us a couple of years ago. Now, I don't understand why we don't already have a second forestry team that's up and running. Kevin, can you can you address the second forestry team and, and the changes that we made to the structures within forestry over the last couple of years? Uh, yes, it's Kevin Williams again. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we were successful in creating a different staff structure when it came to you know maintenance workers and maintenance crew chiefs. And now we have tree care specialists, ones, twos, and threes. And we have arborists and senior arborists. That helped bring up the level of uh, production and, and professionalism with our staff. Um, I think what Mr. Kendall may be referring to is uh, the second team a couple of years ago, it was a budget request item that I don't I don't recall where it left off, but there was talk of building out more staff. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where that left off, but we were successful in gaining, again, the, the higher level of professionalism when it comes to certified arborists and uh, track qualified inspectors and those sorts of things. So uh, we're bringing the level of professionalism up, but it, as you can see, it's it's not where we'd like it to be. I think this may have been, Ron Kendall, this may have been one of those things that fell to the side under COVID, but it needs to be brought back to the board's understanding that they agreed that we needed more forestry people out there felling trees. Um, Ron, so Sarah Baldwin, deputy director. So so there is there is two crews within forestry. Those crews were established within our own structure and re, um, reclassifying existing p- positions to make those crews. There was never any additional money given to the park authority for a separate crew or the equipment that would go with a, with a separate crew. Um, so this is something that every time we put in a budget request, um, whether it's third quarter carryover or general fund budget request through the typical budget process, that this is something that we have included in every presentation that we've done. Okay. And I, I guess my second thing is I'd like to see a 10-year scope rather than a next budget cycle scope. Um, because I'm. this is obviously going to be a bell curve at some point. I don't know how far it is out, 20, 30 years, the bell starts shaping back down, but we need to show them what the peak of cost is against the the years it's going to take us to recover if we do nothing now. This is Jay, um, executive director again. I agree, since I've been here in the two years, it's not a, it's not a lack of asking for money. Um, it's a lack of having that that money appropriated. Um, you know, we have staff that are going out there and inspecting trees, but a lion's share of the of the money that Kevin is talking about is contract uh, dollars to take the to take the trees down. We're limited by how much 
you know, work where we can do to take the trees down without, you know, increased funding. It's not, it's not necessarily, and my bell curve is not necessarily going to bell curve, curve trees, you know, the trees are going to get older and other trees are going to come down and there's going to be something, you know, it's the nature of the beast when you, you know, own the majority of the natural areas um, in the county. So it, there's not a, a 10 year projection for how much we're going to need. We need however much it's going to take in order to keep the infrastructure and the, um, and the residents safe. And it might next year, it might be, you know, $600,000. Next year it might be 2 million. We just don't know, but it's such a reactive game. Um, and so what it does is it, is it, is it causes us to shift so much of our time, effort and funding into making sure that we're able to take these, you know, trees down. In the future, we're going to have the zero waste ordinance. It's going to be recycling and trash. That's going to take more staff, maintenance staff away for for making sure that we're. It's just it's 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 a cumulative, you know, it's a cumulative thing. But again, this is this is a this is a problem, um, like you say, across the county. I mean, in Reston, we're dealing with this same situation. I mean, trees are falling all the time, Reston Association can't keep up with it. Um, but what we what we need to do at this point is at least bring attention to it. So across the street, they understand numbers and pictures. I think we should take this report and we should send a very frank note to uh, Chairman McKay and Brian Hill and say, here's the situation. It's a safety issue at this point and we need more resources to deal with it now. And, and go from there. Jim. Yes, thank you. I, I think maybe in tandem with that, uh, to fund the uh, program that we have right now, we've deferred uh, projects that need to be done. Um, and to me, that's the other side of this coin, is not only is our tree budget going to continue to escalate, but the uh, the extent uh, extent of deferred maintenance is going to escalate as well, and I don't know whether it it makes much difference when we talk with board members. It probably should if we had some sense, as we did uh, in Kevin's presentation, as to what uh, what projects were robbed uh, to fund the tree removal, and if we could get some handle on what that would be. Uh, it speaks more definitively to uh, both the need for tree funding, but also some of the adverse effects uh, to actual projects that need to be done. And I don't know whether some of those projects that aren't done are uh, similar to what we saw with trip hazards on trails and the like, but uh, there's risk associated there potentially with what we're not uh, dealing with on case by case, by case basis. Thank you. Jim, thank, thank you, Sarah Baldwin, Deputy Director. Thank you for saying that. I think, you know, one of the really important items to take away from this presentation is the deferred maintenance. You know, we talk about the maintenance of parks, but, and we talk about the budget requests and one of our budget requests this year was over a million dollars so we could start recycling and have a better management process for trash within the parks. If we weren't overspending in forestry every year, we could fund those positions and we could start recycling in all of our parks. So it kind of puts in perspective the things that we're not able to do because of the overspending every year. Anybody else? Kyle. This is Kyle Stone. I know the general thing in vogue is to contract out whenever and wherever possible, but do we know like on a cost per tree basis, are we better or more cost effective at cutting trees is a potential way to cut a few more, bringing more of this in house, or is that a good money saving option to keep keep the contractor? This is Kevin Williams, Park Operations Branch Manager. Uh, that's something we're looking into now to evaluate that very thing and that analyze uh, you know staffing work versus contract work. Um, the costs continue to go up with contracts. And of course, the quantity does as well. And that's what we've been asking for is more staff to take some of the burden off of contract dollars. So uh, we don't have a dollar uh, figure to present, but that's something that we certainly would like to look at more analytical uh, data framework. So we will certainly do that. 
Okay, so we're getting a better picture of what's the better bang for the buck and then either we'll continue contracting or maybe you'll come back and say you recommend bringing things more in-house. I think it's going to be a, a, a hybrid approach regardless of what the number ends up being. There's just too much work to take on. We'd have to triple, quadruple our staff, uh, as you saw by the tree numbers going through the roof. Uh, but to contract everything out also is just asking for trouble, in my opinion, because we're subject to whatever increase they throw at us. So thankfully, the current contract has not gone up drastically, um, but that's just a matter of time. So, uh, but yeah, we can report back on that. Okay, thanks. Good, good point, Kyle. And Kevin, I like your answer to that. Does anybody else have anything else? All right. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, are, is anybody have any uh, other matters for the uh, Park Operations Committee? Seeing none, I adjourn the uh, Park Operations Committee. All right, Bill Bowie, it's time for the Budget Committee, and I'll turn it over to Chairman uh, Ken Quincy. Ken Quincy, and I'll call the Budget Committee to order and turn it over to Michael Peter for the item. Great. Thank you very much, Chairman Quincy. This is Michael Peter, Administration Division Director. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for that presentation, Kevin. Uh, you'll see here what we're going over tonight. Uh, we've already talked about uh, how well we're doing from a revenue standpoint. We went through some budget revisions recently. Uh, and this discussion is really so we can go through the items that we are uh, requesting through the DMV process for third quarter additional funds. Through this process, generally what we're looking at are one-time funds, uh, and we're looking at uh, funds not for new projects, but to be able to uh, continue building our capacity or deal with uh, exigent situations uh, like what Kevin was just uh, discussing. So with that, what we'll be seeking is, uh, after this presentation, uh, consensus to be able to move forward uh, tonight with the board uh, to uh, hopefully vote to endorse uh, these items. Uh, and then we will move forward with that submission uh, in uh, the next week or so. Uh, next slide, please, Allison. We have one action item, uh, and it's these third quarter items here. Uh, we did also send out a little bit more detail uh, in the board packet. So next slide, please. Great, so the items that we're asking for, again, uh, these are all one-time items. Uh, you'll recall in our general fund budget request, we asked for ongoing the additional dollars to be able to support the increased costs for AV uh, services, as well as uh, the additional length of concerts that we undertake in the summertime. So this is one time to get us through this summer. Also, we're asking for uh, some assistance from the county for one time uh, costs related to uh, installing and implementing a biometric time card system for our hourly employees uh, throughout the uh, uh, entire system at all uh, 50 plus of our staff sites. We're asking for some additional computer hardware uh, to keep up with uh, the uh, continuing trend to be able to work uh, remotely uh, and also to be able to take laptops wherever we need to uh, within the park system. Uh, at uh, Sully, uh, as we've talked a little bit about some of our equity initiatives, uh, this summer uh, we are uh, undergoing a pilot program uh, where we are working very closely with uh, uh, NCS uh, and other partners to be able to identify uh, people who may be from more economically vulnerable areas to be able to experience our summer camps at a reduced fee. We're doing that this summer with existing equity money, uh, and we are asking to be able to continue that uh, into the next summer to extend that solely initiative as well. Tied uh, also with that uh, rec pack, uh, we're asking for some additional funding uh, to uh, help us support uh, the higher salaries uh, as we are working to be competitive in summer camp and lifeguard salaries. Uh, this is an initiative that we undertook to be able to move our starting salary up to about $16 uh, and then uh, being able to offer additional salaries for people who are coming back for uh, subsequent years after being part of our program. Mm -hmm. uh, forestry, as Kevin talked about, this is our $500,000 request for additional uh, contract dollars to be able to deal with those urgent tree situations. We're still not 
uh, necessarily at a point where we can deal with those low or medium or proactive tree areas. So this is that uh, request, which uh, uh, he outlined just a few minutes ago. And then finally, uh, we continue to uh, chip away at our capital equipment uh, replacement needs on the park operations side. So this is uh, after funding that we received as part of uh, closeout last year. This is our next round of uh, major equipment replacements. These are uh, certain vehicles, mowers, uh, 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 field groomers, those really large uh, machine items that we need to be able to keep our park system looking uh, as good as it does. So this adds up to total uh, requests of almost $1.7 million. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, ask, uh, answer any additional uh, questions that may come up. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Quincy. Thank you, Mike. Uh, now, questions? Whoops, I just got blanked out here. Yes, Ron. Yeah, I guess this is Ron Kendall. I, my main question is, when we take this to the board as items we want, is this a pick list for them to decide what they're willing to spend money on and what they're not willing to spend money on? Um, I feel like, we should be spending money on the things we think are most important and then we should rank them. Um, I put forestry way above summer concerts and yep. yet it's the first thing on the list that I see when I look at this slide. Um, capital equipment as well. They're the things that we have to have. We wanna do the equity pieces but if we can't maintain our equipment or keep people safe in the park from falling trees, what does equity mean? Uh, Mr. Kendall, thank you for that question. This is uh, again, Michael Peter with the administration division. Uh, the uh, list that we put together, this is generally handled uh, first and foremost through the county executives deliberative process. Uh, and we do rank these items. Uh, and uh, when we move forward, we do have something like uh, the summer concert series first, because that is something that uh, will, of course, have uh, widespread support from uh, the board members. And we have to keep doing that forestry. We have to keep doing. So we do prioritize the safety and security items uh, first as we go forward. And we work closely uh, through uh, Jay's office and the directors uh, the, with the deputy directors to uh, identify those things. If we're given a certain amount of money that can support these items, uh, then we do prioritize those. But uh, right now uh, we are putting forward the whole package for $1.7 million. Other questions? Well, I have one and it ties ties into both the presentations. Uh, those of us, uh, those of us that have been on the board for a while have heard not infrequently about the need for us to take care of what we have. And that just doesn't include equipment. It includes obviously as we brought up before, the, uh, <clears throat> the growth, the structures, the uh, trees. And if we're robbing in some instances, the ability to maintain such things as equipment to take care of trees, uh, we're really not gaining anything. And, uh, and this has uh, been brought to our attention by the board in the past, as some of us will remember. So uh, I, would, I would hope that the board would uh, to follow up on Ron Kendall's comment, uh, take our comments pretty seriously since uh, it was there and I'll call it criticism in the past that we weren't taking care of what we have. Uh, Ken, one, well, one other comment, if I may, Tim Hackman. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I just uh, noticed an article on WTOP where the uh, school board, which has already published its uh, proposed budget for, uh, for next year, um, has, an, uh, has an article that's been picked up that, um, that highlights their uh, inability to retain personnel because their uh, uh, salary structure, um, it, it's alleged, is is not competitive. Um, uh, it it um, is a little dis 
disturbing that uh, we now have, uh, um, you know, what appears to be a, a, a public uh, uh, information uh, campaign to try to build up support for uh, uh, for uh, uh, um, uh, a budget. And um, I just uh, raise that issue as a point of observation. So that's all I'll say for now. Thank you so much, Ken. You're welcome. And Mr. Quincy, to your question uh, about taking care of uh, what we have, I think that again, gets to the point of uh, Kevin's presentation a few minutes ago. Uh, we do have to, of course, react when we have these trees fall or if they're in danger of falling. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly we are appreciative of uh, the board allocating significant sinking funds to us each year. But at the same time, there's a big uh, mix here. And uh, when we have those limited funds, we bring this up. This is an easy one for us to be able to uh, uh, this is an easy one for us to be able to uh, sell because uh, for every tree, there's a certain amount of money uh, that it costs from uh, the perspective of um, contract dollars there. And Mr. Quincy, if I could add, I uh, misspoke there about the Sully item. Uh, that was not uh, the uh, Sully equity pilot. That was actually uh, funding uh, that we are requesting for uh, uh, assistance in helping us reinterpret uh, the history of the Sully historic site. Uh, so that's a little bit different. It is part of our equity initiatives, uh, and uh, it's a request for us to find some outside consulting support uh, to help us uh, reinterpret the uh, stories uh, and the important history from that site. Thanks, Mike. Any other questions, comments? Is the consensus to move this forward? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you. There, thank you, Mr. Quincy. Thank you, Mike. If there is no other discussion uh, and we have, have a consensus to move this one forward, I will adjourn the budget committee meeting. Thank you, Ken. It's uh, a little past seven o'clock, and I'd like to call to order the a uh, meeting of the Park Authority Board on January 25th, 2023. Um, I'm Bill Bowie, and uh, we always start with our public comment period. And uh, so I'll reach out to Ben and see uh, if we have anybody this evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. I'm Ben Boxer, the Public Information Officer for the Park Authority. Uh, this evening, we have no speakers signed up to speak Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right, so we'll go on to our administrative item. Countywide admin item number one is the adoption of the minutes of the January 11th, 2023 Park Authority Board meeting. Uh, this is Tim Ackman. I second the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That motion carries. Action item countywide A1 is the FY 2023 Third quarter budget review fund 10,000 and or from 1,001 general fund. Ken Quincy, I make a motion to approve the FY 2023 third quarter budget review fund 1,001 general fund. Uh, this is Tim Hackman, I second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those say nay, that motion carries. Information item, um, countywide information item number one was the natural resource management plan, FY22 accomplishments, and FY23 implementation plan it was well done. And countywide information item number two was the cultural resource management plan, FY2022 um, accomplishments, and FY23 implementation plan. Chairman's matters. Camps, camps, camps seem to be a recurring theme no matter which agency um, we're dealing with. So it's good to see that we've got such an emphasis on um, trying to accommodate as many folks as we can. It's really important. People are starting to go back to the office a little bit. So uh, parents are gonna be looking for ways to, uh, to keep their, uh, their kids occupied. So. Uh, thank you for the great job that you're doing um, with the camps and looking forward to that. 
Uh, the foundation report we received earlier this week, we almost 900,000, over $900,000 so far this fiscal year. That's a great, great beginning. Uh, looking forward to doing more, but uh, thank you for putting that out. That gives us a real um, look at what's going on and, and what our targets should be um, going forward. I know there's a lot of opportunity um, for the uh, the Park Foundation to play. Um, congratulations, Lynn Wood and all with the uh, ribbon cutting and the start official start of uh, the building, rebuilding of the uh, Mount Vernon Rec Center. Um, I have been stopped by at least five people that live nowhere near Mount Vernon to tell me how happy they are. They learned to skate at that arena and it's well worth it being closed for the next two years in order for them to get a center. It has gone tremendously well thanks to a good communication by staff because all of these people were informed where they could go for their new classes, how long the, uh, the program was gonna take. So uh, great, great job by uh, everybody. And then last but not least, um, I've had a couple of conversations with uh, the Washington Nationals and uh, they are looking for us to potentially partner on another project under the guise of Battle of the Badges. It's a softball tournament among police and fire and federal uh, enforcement uh, folks to, uh, to have a softball tournament at some point in time this year that will culminate in the championship at uh, being played at Nationals Park. So it's something that's pretty cool and I'm sure we'll have more information on that going forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jen. Thank you very much, Chairman Bowie. Um, I'm going to ask you that all to, we still get Linwood home in time. I have a couple of director's matters on slides and then I'm gonna do a very short equity update. Um, so director's matters, next slide, Allison. So as uh, Bill just mentioned, we had our ground breaking on January the 18th um, for the new Mount Vernon uh, Rec Center. Um, this is, it was a phenomenal um, event. Uh, Congressman Beyer was there, but he's very, very excited. I do want to point out, I don't know how many of the staff are on on, on um, this call or will watch this, but I just wanted to um, point out, Bill hit the nail on the head. It was a phenomenal work by our staff, not only at Mount Vernon Rec Center, but at all of the surrounding rec centers who are seeing surges and welcoming new patrons to their rec centers, Franconia George, and George Washington um, are, are seeing the bulk of the increased um, usage. Um, the fact that we shut a, an entire rec center down and sold throughout, moved someplace else, every single piece of everything in that rec center, um, all while setting up a concierge service to let patrons know exactly where they can look for to or to not disrupt their normal routine as much. It's, it was a Herculean effort. And I just wanted to um, really thank staff again for everything that they did to get us to this point. Next slide. Okay, so Burke Lake, um, uh, here you go. Uh, Mike, Burke Lake is number one in something. Burke Lake and Oakmar top in the U.S. Um, for golf ranges. Um, it was recognized as the top, one of the top 50 public ranges by Golf Range Magazine. Um, and based on their dedication and welcome, um, dedicate and welcome new social and established golf enthusiasts. So congratulations to Burke Lake and Oakmar. And not to be outdone, Laurel Hill ranked the 11th golf course in Virginia. Total golf course is not public. Um, it was ranked the number 11 best golf course in Virginia by Golf Pass for its well-maintained greens and fairways, challenging layup, robust practice facility, and friendly staff and volunteers. So I wanna thank all of the, um, the golf crew uh, who are still maintaining the utmost in customer service and making sure that our uh, golf courses are awesome. Next slide. And last but not least, um, I'm not really sure if you know about this project, Mike Thompson, but there's a project Patriot Park North um, 
that's happening. The fields are scheduled to be completed and turned over to FCPA um, in early March. Uh, we already have 24 baseball tournaments scheduled in 2023. Um, 12 tournaments received grants um, over $100,000. Um, projected economic impact of these tournaments is over $5 million um, in uh, tourist revenue to the county. Um, we're also going to be having FCPA camps and external sports clinics scheduled in 2023. So we're very excited about that. Um, that's the last slide for the director's matter. And I'm going to attempt, Allison right now is holding her breath to see if I'm going to be able to um, do it myself. I think I can. You guys are seeing my screen, right? Okay, great, fantastic. So I wanted to take a couple minutes to give you um, a global equity update. I know we talk about things a lot in, in terms of the revenue fund, but I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about all of the things that we're working on and doing and put equity in um, perspective in FCPA. So I'm just gonna start, um, I always like to start by talking about how important, um, why equity is important when it comes to parks and, and recreation and participation in guided recreation programs from low, low income at risk youth result in higher uh, self-esteem, greater academic achievement and lower incidences of delinquency. That's why our rec centers are so very important to the quality of life of all um, residents and specifically um, res lower income residents of color. Um, of, in the 100 most populated cities, neighborhoods where most, where most residents or people of color have access to an average of 44% less park acreage than predominantly white neighborhoods. And parks that serve primarily low-income households are on average four times smaller than parks that serve a majority of high-income households. And parks that so that that serve low income primarily low income households are average of four times smaller than parks that serve majority of high income households. And a lot of you know it really comes down to the fact that our parks um, really are the free gym for a lot of residents. You can choose to get out in, into a, a park and and run every day and lose fifty pounds um, for free. We also have phenomenal amenities in our rec centers. Um, for affordable prices. Okay, so really what I'm gonna go over is these are sort of some of the things that we're gonna talk about um, really quickly. Racial equity in parks, we already talked about that. Equity plan, our equity plan overview, um, funding, our equity study, um, and some other stuff. I'm not gonna read those through so that um, we can get home. So just wanna put this up here. I put this up all the time as to, um, if you ask me what my definition of racial equity in parks is, it's where uh, race and income does not predict the quantity and quality of parks in a specific area, and rec centers are affordable for all residents. So one of the things that we um, are working on, and uh, Sarah Baldwin is our lead in this effort, is we have an um, um, equity impact plan. And the goal of that plan is to ensure our community, regardless of race and or income, has access to high quality parks, programs, and services. Um, access to quality and safe parks and facilities, programs, diversifying the workforce, community engagement, and telling untold stories. And this is all to continue advancing one Fairfax. So when you think of our equity impact plan, think of that as the overarching umbrella for everything that we're gonna be talking about. Our revenue equity in the revenue fund, it's in the equity action plan, diversity and um, inclusion in, with our staff in the equity um, action plan. Everything that we're doing, it's really the, our guiding um, force to tell us sort of how we're, we're doing and what our goals are for the next year. It's updated every year. And that will come out, I believe we're finalizing that soon. So when it's finalized, it will be posted and we will um, definitely send out copies to everybody so that you can um, peruse it. Um, this one I'm gonna throw out again. I know you've seen this before, but when we talk about equity in the revenue fund, this is the, um, the uh, um, our demographics by line of business. Um, again, compared the county population demographics with the demographics from four revenue fund lines of business um, and one rec pack that is funded 100% through general funds. And so on the left, you see um, the county demographics is rounded to the nearest percent. Um, white residents are a little less than 50%. So um, Fairfax County is a majority uh, minority county. We're 20% Asian, 16% Hispanic, Latino, 9% Black, and 4% other. 
So we look at our lines of business, despite being less than half the population, you know, white residents make up 68% of our classes, 69% of summer camps, 79% of rec center past memberships, 82% of golfers, but only 28% of rec pack users. Um, only 21% of our rec, pack, rec center pass holders are people of color. Um, we also analyze household income, but this just gives you, this is kind of our, our, um, our litmus test, uh, so to speak. Okay, so equity funding. If you remember in FY23, um, we were funded uh, $500,000. That was the actual budget that came in. Um, what that is gonna be used for or is, is being used for is the HRNA study that you're all uh, familiar with. I'll get into that in a second. Um, the first thing that Mike talked about, which was the Sully Community Center equity pilot, there's two Sully's, um, and this is exactly what he was talking about is ensuring in the new gym um, that we have, we financed at the Sully Community Center, where we're gonna have third party camps, making sure that um, we have an equitable distribution of uh, residents using both um, facilities. We are in the, in the process of hiring an equity officer. Um, that's another slide. And then uh, we were had a pilot program for rec center access for foster care caregivers um, to allow foster care caregivers to access our rec centers for free. And FY24, our request was $803,980. Um, as part of our ongoing work to make the Park Authority more equitable, um, that was our, our, our request. Although we're working with our consultants to develop an equitable fee structure for the revenue fund, that work is still in progress. And while it's being completed, it's really essential that we not uh, further exacerbate inequities, specifically in summer camps. Um, as Chairman Bowie had mentioned, um, summer camps are one of the places where we see some of the deepest and most pervasive gaps between user demographics and the demographics of the county. Um, this is compounded by the reality that you know, Park Authority summer camps serve a vital role for families as school-aged child care during the summer. Um, so the funding request that we that we put in was to not increase summer camp fees for 2023. We are off in scheduling um, because of the way that the budget works and the way and the timing that we put forth our fee package, especially for summer camps. And so we've been working um, with DMB to explain exactly what it is that we are trying to do with holding summer camps. You see, that's a big number and that's just to hold summer camps flat and not have increased them this year. Um, so we are, in our conversations, we took a, a leap um, and um, in conversations across the, and we held across the street and we held summer camp fees for this year. So we did not increase our fees for summer camp this year, which is a huge, um, it's a huge step in the right direction. FY25, we don't know what it is because it's really going to be dependent on how the equity study um, finalizes. So speaking of the equity study, this is where we are with that. We are right now inter internally finalizing the work, that the, the data that the consultants have compiled and the work that the consultants are doing. Once we have finalized it internally, we're going to be coming to the Park Authority Board um, via a work session. It's not going to be a final report. We want to present the data. We want to talk it through um, in open session and, and, and see um, where we are. After that, we're going to be going to um, the public for public engagement this summer. Um, and then in the fall, after public engagement, we will come back and, and um, possibly um, uh, rearrange some stuff or make some edits. And we will be taking it back to the Park Authority Board and then to the Board of Supervisors for an update. Um, while we're doing that in those updates, um, and subsequently, we're going to be finalizing the implementation strategy for that's recommended in the report in coordination with the Park Authority Board, um, the Board of Supervisors, and um, County Executive's Office, and DMV, DMB. And then with the hopes of winter 2023, finalizing and posting the report. Um, as I said before, we are hired in the midst of hiring an equity officer. It is closed right now. Our interviews are scheduled for um, next month. Um, the role of that equity officer is to do a lot of the things that um, you see me and Sarah and other people doing as a focus, um, and, and Amy, as a focus of, of what of their job. Um, build strategic partnerships, not only with uh, the Park Authority Board, senior staff, county agencies, um, one Fairfax, community stakeholders, 
um, lead, implement, and operationalize that outward facing portions of the One Fairfax strategic framework um, for FCPA, um, manage the FCPA equity action plan, and guide community engagement efforts to ensure all voices are heard. It's a really important um, position for us that really is um, uh, walking the walk and making sure that we are um, being as equity, equitable as possible. Um, another, another thing that we are working on is we're going to be sending out a survey, a staff survey done by the Government um, Alliance on Race and Equity. Um, we're one of the pilot agencies conducting the GARE sur survey. There are eight agencies that are participating, um, Department of Family Services, the Libraries, Health Department, um, NCS, um, CSB, and us. We anticipate that the survey is going to be released to staff in the next month. It's about a 50-question survey. Um, one Fairfax added a couple of mandatory questions for all surveys, but we did have a little bit of a say in um, some of the questions. We make sure that we're getting really good data so we know where we need to, to go and what we need to do to make sure that our staff are, are not only diverse, but that they understand um, the work that we're doing. So the purpose of the survey is to assess the knowledge, skills, and experiences of our workforce related to race and equity. The results of the employee survey will allow us to assess our efforts to create um, shared understanding about racial equity and how implementation of racial equity strategies is progressing. Um, specifically, it's gonna tell us um, the following. So it's gonna tell us uh, our employees understanding about racial equity, our employees knowledge of the county's policies and practices to advance racial equity, their awareness of the counties and the department's plans to advance racial equity, and how much do they know of the county's efforts to engage the broad community, including its community of color and community partnerships to advance racial equity. Um, it's a national, um, nationally known organization that does um, work on race and equity, and we're really lucky to be able to uh, utilize this tool. Um, and uh, we have spoken about it before. We're going to be having a summer um, briefing on February 22nd, so I'm not going to go into it. We've talked a lot about our PROSA plan, but the, our Park Recreation Open Space and Access Plan is, is really key to looking at equity in um, park spaces, um, anal analyzing and identifying gaps in the 10-minute walk to parks and the complete park experiences, um, and looking at those data with an equity equity lens. So that's a little bit of the product phases. I'm not going to go into it because you're going to get a briefing at our next board meeting on PROSA. Um, and uh, lastly, I mentioned it before and Mike mentioned it um, before, but we're doing a pilot at Sully Community Center. Um, as you all know, Sully Community Center just opened. So this will be the first summer we contributed funds to add a second gym. Um, and without this pilot, it would be um, that slide that we talked about, the differences in demographics in practice in a gym, with one gym being for NCS and one gym being an FCPA third-party camp. So we wanted to make sure that that didn't happen um, and that the both courts were uh, used by uh, more of um, a demographically equivalent with the county um, user group. Um, but also we saw it as, a, as an opportunity to test out a sliding fee scale. So um, FCPA, we're partnering with NCS to offer programs and camps at Sully Community Center and test that um, sliding fee scale to provide access to camps. Um, we're anticipating that this is about $150,000. This was included in that FY23 um, budget at $500,000. This is one of the items that we were funding. Um, so the process for this is NCS is going to be in identifying individuals and families who would benefit in, from enrollment in our camps um, at the Sully Community Center who have documented financial need and determine their payments required. And they're going to work with the individual and the family to register and us to register participants for camps and classes. Um, we're going to hold spaces in camps to allow for the greatest access to programs possible. And then um, evaluation, all parties will receive a survey to measure the demographics, overall satisfaction and attendance. It's a real way of looking at a, um, a smaller subset and seeing if we could extrapolate that and get be successful at Sully Community Center and see how much we can extrapolate across our entire um, system. So with that, I am done and I would be, I don't know if you want to take questions now or um, during your individuals. So.
Thank you, Chairman. Quick, quick, yeah, quick question for you. So on the GARE study, um, two questions. One, will it be statistically valid? And two, is it going to be offered to all employees of the Park Authority? So um, I'm going to, so the first question, I'm going to say it will be statistically valid because now I'm going to check and make sure that it's, but it's GARE. So GARE doesn't do non, it, they, they're, they would not do it if it's not statistically valid, but I will confirm that and get back to you that it is going to be a statistically valid survey. And yes, it will be given to all FCPA staff. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Very, very good. Mr. Kendall, we'll go to board matters. Mr. Kendall? No, I will pass today. Okay. Linwood. Like to uh, reiterate what Jay and uh, Bill have uh, already said this past Wednesday, dirt flu. It was a, a very, very nice event. A lot of people really excited about that. And uh, like to take an opportunity really to say, to, to, to thank uh, all of the board who has supported this project for uh, what is it, like 12 years now in the making and we are finally rolling forward with it. And of course, staff, this was truly a huge effort, a lot of teamwork and we got there. We are, we are, we are there. We are breaking ground. In two years, we're gonna have a rec center. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you very much for everyone that contributed to it. I want to take a special little shout out for uh, Ben Boxer, who did a, a great job of uh, organizing and putting the program together. It's also helped me with uh, some other matters this uh, this in the last two weeks. And uh, thank you very much, Ben, uh, for uh, everything you've helped uh, me in the Mount Vernon Magisterial District and the uh, Rec Center um, with uh, in the uh, in this last month. Um, want to also uh, thank uh, Amy, Sam, and Cindy, and I don't think I'm forgetting about anybody, but extra thanks to them if I am, for everything you guys are doing and will continue to do on the uh, Overlook Ridge uh, future board that uh, we're all trying to put together. Uh, when, we, uh, when we get that done, that's really going to be special, and uh, I hope to be uh, up at the top of that uh, in the next couple of years with all of you with a ribbon and you'll know, see the spectacular view that that park uh, is going to provide. And lastly, uh, as I promised I would do uh, uh, this month instead of last, I'd like to give a really, really special thanks to Bill for his uh, outstanding leadership my entire term uh, on the board. Uh, Bill, you've served uh, with honor and wisdom this whole time. And uh, I have witnessed uh, under your leadership, uh, I believe this board to become the, uh, the most functional in the county. If there's a more functional board in this one, I'd like to see it. And, and again, that occurred uh, as I am witnessed under your, witnessed under your leadership, leadership. Thank you very much, Bill. Appreciate it. Thank you, Linwood. Tim? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I pass. All right. Dr. Carter? Well, good evening. I just would like to reiterate what I did um, last time, and that is to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership, your guidance, uh, and your friendship. So looking forward to continuing to work with you on the board. And I want to thank uh, also all of the staff for your outstanding work. Um, we are so much better off because of your wisdom and your guidance. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle Pfizer. I'll pass, sir. Okay. Kyle. I will also pass. Thanks. All right. Jim. Um, I'll uh, align myself with Linwood's comments. I think they were right on target. So with that, I'll pass. Thank you, sir. Mr. Quincy. You're on mute. Somebody did that to me. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mike Peterson was. Was there really any question about who the which of the two best golf courses were? <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's for sure. I guess Mike didn't hear that. Uh, I, I will echo uh, uh, Linwood's comments too, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for everything. And uh, I just want to uh, make one last comment concerning, <clears throat> uh, in some ways, the equity plan and our finances. Uh, in the equity plan that uh, Jay outlined, she mentioned quality and safe parks and facilities. And we talked about that in the two previous presentations concerning the budget and forestry. So uh, this is important to us. It's important to the folks across the street and of course to the public. So I hope that message can be underlined as it's transmitted to the appropriate parties. That's all. Great, thank you, sir. Mike? Yeah, thank you. Um... I echo, I, Bill, thank you for your leadership on the board. Um, discussed that last time, but just thank you again. Um, on a less cheerful note, I, I, I wanna thank Jay and staff for stepping up. Um, as some of you are aware, and I think I may have mentioned last time, um, three young members of our community were involved in a, a serious car accident on Lee Chapel Road. <clears throat> two of them were killed, two 16 year old girls. Uh, one lived. Um, and, uh, the area of Lee Chapel where the accident was, uh, has park property right next to it. And I know that, um, Jay and staff, um, are, are helping and dealing with those issues. Um, I know there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but the speed and the quality of engagement, uh, that they have undertaken and response both to the Board of Supervisors, VDOT and FCDOT has, has been extraordinary and, and the community really appreciates um, stepping up and, and being helpful in this. Um, it, it was a real tragedy uh, and, and um, there's, there's nothing we can do uh, to get those two lives back, but we can, maybe help a little and hoping that that nothing like that happens again. So thank you, Jay, for you and the staff for all you're doing on that. Thank you, Mike. Dr. Hewton. Um, I, I wanna add my voice to saying thank you so much, Chairman Bowie, um, and thank you to our staff, all the staff for all your hard work. That's it. Thank you. Maggie? Once again, I agree with uh, Linwood on this, um, Bill. We uh, we really all appreciate your leadership. You've really made us such a great board, and uh, we're glad you're sticking around um, just so we can poke fun at you. What the heck? Thank you very <laughs> you much. Yeah, I, can't, right. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. All right. So it's been a pleasure, folks. That's for sure. It's been great. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Faisal Khan, who's going to head up the uh, nomination committee. We'll turn it over to him. All right, this is this is show time. <laughs> All right, so uh, a copy of the proposed slate for 2023 Park Authority Board offices has been distributed, and each member should have received a copy by email by the director's office. The following names have been placed in nomination. For the position of chairman, it's Mr. Kyle Stone. For vice chair, it's Maggie Godbold. For the position of secretary, uh, Dr. Cynthia Jacobs Carter. And for the position of treasurer, it's Timothy Hackman. So we're going to start with the chairman's position first. The nominee for the office of the chairman is Kyle Stone. Are there any nominations from the floor? I move the nominations be closed. Do we have a second? I second the motion, Ken Quincy. All right, so any discussion? No, then, okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 The ayes have it. So the chairman of the board for 2023 is Kyle Stone. All right, so we move to the vice chair now. 
The nominee for the office of the vice chair is Maggie Godbold. Are there any nominations from the floor? I move the nominations be closed. I second the motion. Great. So all in favor say aye. 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 Who say no, the ayes have it. The votes are tallied and the vice chair for the board for 2023 is Maggie Godbold. All right, so now the nomination, the nominee for the office of the secretary is Cynthia Jacobs Carter. Are there any nominees from the floor? I move that nominations be closed. I second that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Both say no, the ayes have it. The secretary of the board for 2023 is Cynthia Jacobs Carter. So last but not the least, the nominee for the Office of Treasurer is Timothy Hackman. Are there any nominations from the floor? I move the nominations be closed. Second the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Both say no. Ayes have it. The treasurer for 2023 is Timothy Hackman. So the following is the 2023 Authority Board Officers are Chairman Kyle Stone, Vice Chair Maggie Godbold, Secretary Cynthia Jacobs Carter, Treasurer Timothy Hackman. On behalf of the nominating, nominating committee, I congratulate the 2023 Fairfax County Park Authority Board Officers and thank the board members for their support during the nominate, nominating process and the wonderful staff. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Linwood. Just wanna take a second to uh, thank Mike Thompson for uh, all his uh, service to us and uh, his ability to read very, very fast. And uh, <laughs> Cynthia, we're about to find out how fast you can read, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Mike. Practicing. <laughs> Absolutely. Here, here. Kyle, any words? Uh, I'll keep it very short so I can start my tenure by honoring the tradition of making sure Linwood is home by eight o'clock. <laughs> um, just want to thank the faith and confidence all of you have in me for, for putting me in this position. It's humbling. I'm excited to get going. It's been great talking with many of you over the last couple of weeks. I've reached out to most of you. We'll reach out to the, the rest between now and um, the first meeting in February. It's been good conversations, learning more about what's going on in your district, your vision for the Park Authority generally. And it's good to hear that everybody's on the same page by and large. Um, a lot of good positive things being said about the, the system, but also a lot of people who understand and are willing to work to keep the system moving forward and realizing there are things we can and should and need to improve. Um, so I look forward to working with all of that on over the next 12 months and that I'll shut up and just say thank you. All right. Good deal. Well, thank you, everybody. For one last time, we are adjourned. Um, <laughs> uh, Dr. Dr. Bill. Yes. Dr. I, I had something to say. Oh, just real quick. I wanted to add my voice to say thank you to Mike and congratulations to the new office. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Very good. Anything else? Tim, were you saying something? Okay. All I'm right. Saying good night. Thank All you. All right. <laughs> With that, folks, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, and we'll see night. you in February. Night. Good night. Bye, all. Bye. -bye. Same.